on the Sunday before Christmas. Uh, it's a privilege to preach because there are people here visiting that were in the church that I grew up in, Maurice and Lorna. I don't know if they're here. Yeah, he's, my mom said you were going to be here this morning. I'm Jean, Erica's son. <laughs> so, so they've come all the way to George to hear someone that grew up in the church that we went to in Joburg. So welcome, welcome. So it's a privilege because I get to, ch- to preach the Christmas message, which I think is a first for Basson. Yeah, he's never had a Sunday Christmas morning off for the last 20 years. Oh yeah, he's going to do, he's doing the Ghost of Christmas past next week. <laughs> So, we, so we, we're just grateful to be here together and to celebrate the significance of this time. And I think, you know, Christmas is special. And to everyone at home, we hope you are safe and that you've got family with you. And we really hope that this message will be special because Christmas is special. Okay. So the, it, the title of my message is Creating Space, A Christmas Story. So it'll become more apparent as I share the story. So in our lives, in our family, Tracy has this, my wife Tracy, has this beautiful prophetic gift of creating space. So we had this jungle gym in our garden, and we planted some trees in random spots just as we got given them, and we stole some from the land next door. And we planted these trees in the the jungle gym. But the kids got older, and they weren't playing in the jungle gym, and we really wanted a pool, because that's what you want when your kids are a bit older. But we didn't have money or space ready for a pool. So Tracy said, you know what we need to do? Let's get rid of the jungle gym. Let's create a space for the pool. And so she phoned Sean, and Sean took the jungle gym, and the jungle gym came to the school, and there was a space. And a few months or whatever later, we had a swimming pool because it was there. The space was ready for it. And it actually, since the pool is in, all the trees make sense. It's like we've created this beautiful space in our yard. And also, um, another time we, were, we needed a second car. And again, we didn't have the money, and it was getting tricky. And Tracy said, I'm going to clear because we've got two garages. She said, I'm going to clear out the second garage so that we are ready for a car. And I was like, great. And we did it. And within a few months, we had a second car. I've got, still got to pay for it. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that testimony of last week where if someone got a car, they can testify. I still need to pay for the car. But the space was created. And I really believe there's a prophetic thing when we create space. It's almost like this, it's potential for a miracle. So we've got teenagers at home. Who's got teenagers at home? Okay, we've, there's a few of us. So teenagers is now a new challenge that we, we face. Because when we had kids, we just want to get rid of them, you know, when they're little. When they're teenagers, you've got to go and find them. You've got to go and look for them, you know, find them. Where are they? And you've got to create new space for them because it's a different dynamic now. So we've learned to do road trips, play music, go and get coffee. We've created a new space that we can connect with with our kids. And it's, it's exciting, but it's a new challenge. But there's life in that. And I remember at Christmas time, we'd go up to the cousins in, in Petersburg, and we would create, a, we'd, they'd make a Christmas bed. Who's all slept on a Christmas bed before? And that's, again, it's, it creates memories, beautiful memories, because there's a space that's created. And even this morning, our beautiful new coffee shop is a new space. And I really believe that for, for that, it's a prophetic statement of preparing for, for new things. So creating space is a huge thing. That, that, we, that we can do. But what has this got to do with Christmas? What's this got to do with Christmas? Okay, so if we look at the Bible, I think God is the ultimate one who creates space. So let's look at Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness, and we had the first day. So God created a space for a miracle. It's amazing. that He and God is into the details of that. I mean, the whole of creation is detail. The whole of the Old Testament is detail of God just creating a tabernacle for his presence, creating um, um, 
the, the lineage that would, the, of, of people that would lead up to the birth of Jesus. So creating all of this. But then we get to the birth of Jesus. So God planned for and created the ultimate space for the miracle of the birth of his son. Because we kind of get to the birth of Jesus and we think, well, what went wrong there? You know what I mean? God is so into the details. And then we get the story that, that doesn't really f- make sense. Why would there be this virgin on a donkey in a stable in a manger? Do you know what I mean? If that's the detail, what's gone wrong in a sense? Okay. So, so God had more than 700 years to plan the details of the incarnation and to arrive, arrange the arrival of his son in the right place, at the right time, in the right way. So God had time to plan this. For example, he could have easily arranged that a faithful virgin and a just man in the lineage of David would be found in Bethlehem in line with the prophecy. There's a prophecy in Micah, the second scripture. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old from ancient times. So it was prophesied that the Savior, this, this Savior, would be born in Bethlehem. So everyone knew it has to happen in Bethlehem. So why not just choose someone in Bethlehem? I mean, there's jokes about that, why they couldn't find someone in Bethlehem, but that's, we won't go there. So instead he chooses Mary and Joseph, who live in Nazareth, and on in Bethlehem. I, I wanted to Google on the map how far Bethlehem is from Nazareth, but I didn't. Okay, so now God has kind of created a problem. So to solve the problem, he arranges to get Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem by some personal means. Uh, he could have arranged, sorry, for them to get to Bethlehem for personal reasons, like a relative who needed them urgently, or a dream like he used before, or some private business arrangement, or even a big fat Israeli wedding, <laughs> like a big fat Greek wedding. Yeah. You know, that they could have, it would have been a good excuse to get them to Bethlehem. But he didn't do it that way either. Instead, God moved Joseph and Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem by means of an empire-wide census. He arranged that the most powerful leader in the world would order everyone in the empire to go to the town of their origin to register. That's profound. Why, why, why did it have to be like that? God is into the details. God was making a point. You think you know what I'm doing globally, you have no idea. I'm putting things in place exactly as I please, including the birth of my son. And I think sometimes globally things go on and we don't understand. Especially in this, these last few weeks, so much global stuff has gone on. There's so many plans that have been made and cancelled and changed and reconfigured and then been all fallen apart with travels and corona and operations and so much stuff has gone on. But God is in control. God is in control. That's, that's ultimately what that's all about. So um, God has made a point that he was putting things in place, including the birth of his son. And it becomes crazy to think that a God who wields an empire to move one woman from Nazareth to Bethlehem couldn't even arrange for an available guest room. You know what I mean? That would have been nice, like at the Marriott, the suite, the birth suite, or something, something a little bit cushy or cozy. Who knows that you cannot plan for the birth of a child? Yeah. You know, we've done it three times, and it was, every time it was different. The, the day that Sophia was born, my eldest, Tracy was working with me at the practice, and we trained somebody else up to, to take over from her to assist me. And I remember saying to her at like 11 o'clock, go home, this is three weeks we've got, go home and get ready for your baby. And that night I was washing baby clothes because Sophia was born that afternoon or that evening. It was the next day I was washing. So we were totally unprepared. We had to borrow clothes from friends of ours in the church in the ward next door for Sophia. So we were totally un- unprepared. But that's how birth is. But God was in the details. So let's look at our beautiful... I know, wait. But planning a bed for his son was easier than planning a global census. Jesus was lying in exactly the place God planned. A feeding trough. A feeding trough. Okay. So let's look at the scripture, the beautiful scripture in Luke 2. 
In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. So this is the story I've been telling you up to now. And everyone went to his own town to register. So they went to Bethlehem. So Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. And this is kind of the, the crux of the message. You will find a baby. So this is the angels come, and they've got only one sentence, kind of or one thing to leave with them. I think in, whenever an angel comes, just listen. Because they've got like, they're going to tell you one thing, and you've got to get that right. So the, the point of this whole thing is, Go, and you will find a baby, one, wrapped in cloths, secondly, lying in a manger. And then suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And when they had left, the shepherd said, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Okay, so there's this baby that's been born wrapped in, a, in cloths and lying in a manger. That is the sign. It's a baby in cloths in a manger. So why a manger? Why a manger? What do you think a manger looked like in those days? What do you guys think? Stone. Thank you. Who said that? First prize. Thank you, Uncle Neville. It was actually stone. It was like a stone trough. Um, I googled it, so I've got pictures. So it, it's, it's, I mean, it is, it's about this wide, it's this long, it's made of stone, and it's a trough. Okay. And um, it, it was to feed the animals, that's obviously what it was there for. So what do you think the word manger means? Well done, well done, Peggy. So manger comes from the Latin word for chew or to eat. Okay, a manger or crib was a stone feeding trough that holds hay for large farm animals like cattle, horses, and donkeys. Mangers were located where livestock were kept, places like stables, corrals, or caves. The farmers were sure to keep their mangers well supplied with fodder at all times so the animals would never go hungry. Okay, so mangers full of food all the time, that's where they go to eat, they know that. So I need some help, um, Hilton. You don't have to be baby Jesus. <laughs> well, could you bring that, that stand for me, please? And I'm going to need these props. Thank you. There's always someone who has to play baby Jesus or, or yeah. the Virgin Mary or something. It's normally the pretty girls. Okay. You're done. Thank you. You've done your bit. <laughs> so... Yeah, so this is, you can, we're going to just get ready for some communion later. You can pour it because it'll, I broke the glass last time. So this time I, I decided to, to set myself up before I break the glass. Okay, so Jesus says in John 6 verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And in John 6 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Jesus was not laid in a manger by accident. It is a major spiritual symbol. The infant in the feeding trough is the bread of life. The true bread come down from heaven, and whoever eats this bread will live forever. Isn't that beautiful? It just, it just makes the manger make sense. So this is my idea of stone. That, that, so imagine this is now... A feeding trough. This is marble, solid stone. And this is our baby in its manger. There's our bread. You thought I had a doll. 
There's our bread. So Jesus comes as the bread of life and he's born into a manger. Isn't that beautiful? And he's, he's accessible and he's, he's come to feed us. The manger, the feeding trough, was a sign of what Jesus came to do. He came to offer himself as bread for our souls. He came to satisfy a hunger that could not be satisfied in any other way. Man does not live by bread alone, Jesus said. Yet one of our greatest struggles is that we forget this. We come to believe that if we have enough bread, enough money, enough stuff, we will be satisfied. But there is something, there is something that I'm absolutely certain of. There is nothing that any of us will open on Christmas morning that will ultimately satisfy the deepest longings of our hearts. I'm going to read that again because I remembered I needed cloths. <laughs> there are cloths up. Okay, so this is our baby in the manger with its cloths. <laughs> sleeping. Don't make a noise, he's sleeping. Okay, I'm going to read that again. Man does not live by bread alone. Yet one of our greatest struggles is that we forget this. We come to believe that if we have enough bread, enough money, enough stuff, we will be satisfied. But here's something I'm absolutely certain of. There's nothing that any of us will open on Christmas Day, Christmas morning, that will ultimately, ultimately satisfy the deepest longings of our hearts. Our hearts hunger to know that we are loved, that our lives have meaning and purpose, that we can be forgiven and find grace, that we are not alone, that there is always hope. We hunger to know that even death will not be the end of us, and we hunger for joy and peace and goodness, and grace. Jesus is born and laid in a stone trough as the only one who can satisfy the intense hunger of our souls. Is that beautiful? In this life, we wrestle with the temptation to believe that if we had enough bread, we'd be happy. Luke, in the sign of the manger, is reminding us that Jesus is the only one who can truly satisfy the hunger of our hearts. Amen. The second reason that the manger points to Jesus' Jesus' humble birth, I'm just going to give three reasons. It It embodies a profoundly moving truth that on his first night on this earth, the King of glory, the Son of God, slept in a trough where the animals feed. What a picture of God's desire to identify, not with superstars and celebrities, but with the humble and the poor, with every one of us. This is not exclusive. This is for everyone. But I think the third and the most powerful image for me, I just want to do this first. So this is the baby in the trough, and this is now the animals eating of the bread. And this is what Jesus came to do. He said, this is my body given for you. So that we can eat and we can feed and we can be satisfied and the longings of our hearts can be met. This must look a bit messy. There we go. But I think the third and most powerful image of the manger is a prophetic foreshadowing of the ultimate reason the Son of God was born into this world. His ultimate purpose was to redeem the world, all mankind, to his glorious Father, the creator of heaven and earth. And 33 years later, this Jesus awoke on a stone slab Wrapped in burial cloths, his body had been broken and ripped apart by the sin, the shame, the evil of the world he came to save. Isn't that beautiful? This Jesus, this Jesus, who, as it says in the book of Philippians, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of the servant, he be, he, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself becoming, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And Jesus took the bread at the Last Supper and said, this is my body given for you. This is how the Savior saves. This is how the Messiah fulfills all the promises. This is how the Lord reigns. From infinite deity to feeding trough, 
to the final death on a cross. On a stone slab, wrapped in a cloth, ripped apart for us. But, there's luckily a but, no sooner were the words of the angels out of the angel's mouth, you will find a baby lying in a manger, wrapped in cloth, then the heavens exploded with praise. And it says, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. This is the sign. No other king anywhere in the world was lying in a feeding trough. Find him, and you will find the king of kings, the true son of God. And so Philippians goes on to say, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. Can we have that scripture? Sorry. Philippians 2 verse 9. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And this is who and what we celebrate when we celebrate the birth of a Savior on Christmas morning. Amen. So that's why I wanted to share communion. It's not, it's not normal to do communion on Christmas service, but I think it's just apt to celebrate why Jesus came, to celebrate his humble birth, to celebrate his body torn. And the wine for me today is to celebrate Christmas. You know, that we want to still celebrate. It's a momentous thing that we want to celebrate. So the wine will be for us to celebrate together this morning. So if you want to just, has everyone got bread? I've got enough bread here if you don't have. It's, so if you've got your bread and Yosha's handing out some more of the emblems. And the people at home, you can get your bread and your wine. Someone last week had rice cakes and... <laughs> so we can improvise. So we actually, if you're all ready, we can actually stand together. Let's stand together. Everyone okay? You all got what you need? Okay. So Jesus, we just thank you that as we come to the end of this year and we just reflect on the details of the birth of your son and we see the world, the crazy world around us and we don't always know what's going on. Thank you that the Christmas story reminds us firstly that you are in control. Thank you that you know every detail and you plan things right down to the last detail. Father, we want to thank you for the birth of your son, not in a hotel or a posh clinic, but thank you that in a humble stable and in a feeding trough, the bread of life was born. And that that bread of life is still available to us every day, in every journey that we take, in every season that we go through, in every high and every low, Jesus is the same to yesterday, today, and forever. The bread of life to sustain us. The bread of life to give us hope and, 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 and the joy and the peace and the, glory and the grace that just comes from you, Jesus. But Jesus, we want to celebrate you and celebrate your birth in, the, in, a, in a stable, in a manger by the bread your body given for us. And we want to eat this bread to remember that. Lord Jesus, I thank you that the picture 33 years later is of you on a stone slab wrapped in cloths with your body ripped apart for us, for our sin and for our shame because of your obedience. And we honor you and we thank you for that, that the Christmas story is about a bigger picture. 
but I thank you that you are seated at the right hand of your Father. We thank you that you reign forever and ever and ever, and that we will be part of that one day. Thank you for the glorious inheritance and the future that we have in you. So we want to celebrate that with the wine. We want to celebrate Christmas. We want to celebrate just the glory of this time. We want to celebrate that you are in control. We want to celebrate family. We want to celebrate the gift of Christmas. We want to celebrate life. We want to celebrate the future. We want to celebrate that we are alive at this time in this moment of, of history for a reason. We want to celebrate ultimately you, Father God, your glory, your kingdom, in Jesus' name. Let's drink. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and to sustain it with justice and righteousness from that time and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, to each one of you. He is Messiah. He is the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Over to David. David. 